Welcome to this week's Money Metals Podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these treacherous times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the company voted 2015's Precious Metals Dealer of the Year in the U.S., Money Metals Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap Podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. Coming up, the one and only Mark Faber joins me for an amazing conversation on the state of the U.S. economy, where he sees value, where he sees problems, and gives advice to those considering gold as a safe haven investment. Don't miss an interview with Mark Faber of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report coming up after this week's market update. A busy news week in Washington and an aggressive new U.S. push for regime change in Syria left markets little affected through Thursday. Both the U.S. stock market and gold finished little change on the week before U.S. airstrikes in Syria commenced. Gold began rising and after hours trading Thursday night, as of this Friday recording, gold prices come in at $1,266 an ounce and are registering a weekly gain of 1.2% with most all of that coming here on the final trading day of the week. Silver is now in positive territory for the week as well and is up 0.2% since last Friday's close to trade at $18.40. Meanwhile, both platinum and palladium are putting in slight weekly gains with platinum now trading at $969 an ounce and palladium at $810. The U.S. dollar advanced against foreign currencies midweek as the Federal Reserve released the minutes from its latest meeting. Fed officials expressed some concern over lofty valuations in equity markets but they didn't come out and admit their role in inflating the latest asset bubbles. They did indicate they intend to pursue additional rate increases and eventually shrink their $4.5 trillion balance sheet. If the Fed moved to unload bonds, mortgage-backed securities, and other assets it holds back into the market, it would be playing with fire. The Fed's hawkish tone caused the stock market to give back most of their earlier gains. Speaking of hawks, President Donald Trump's foreign policy advisors convinced him to order Tomahawk missile strikes on Syrian airfields. The strikes began Thursday night. The interventionist wing of the Republican Party has been pushing hard for military action in Syria and Iran. Trump had always positioned himself in opposition to these war hawks. However, earlier this week, President Trump did a massive flip-flop. After campaigning against the expensive regime-changing nation-building and global policing policies of Presidents Obama and Bush, Trump said he'd changed his mind, at least on the issue of letting Assad stay in power. To voters who thought they were electing a different kind of Republican, Trump's hasty retreat on non-interventionism is a big letdown. His apparent embrace of neoconservative Middle East crusades couched in humanitarian rhetoric means that military and foreign aid spending will probably accelerate during his term. That will put upward pressure on the budget deficit and put any potential tax cuts in jeopardy. And if Trump and congressional Republicans can't find a way to deliver on their promise of repealing and replacing Obamacare, they will have completely betrayed the voters who put them into office. For now, investors seem willing to forgive Republicans for their rocky start this year. Political disappointments have had little effect on the stock market or the public's appetite for shares. Inflows to exchange-traded funds hit a record $135 billion in the first quarter, that's up from just $30 billion over the same period last year. As financial markets swell with cash, physical precious metals markets continue to be overlooked by the mainstream. The upshot for contrarians is that premiums on most gold and silver bullion products are extraordinarily low. Today, we are able to offer bags of historic U.S. 90% silver coins for less than a dollar per ounce over spot. This value opportunity is especially attractive when it comes to 90% silver quarters and dimes minted before 1965 because they usually command much higher premiums. In recent years, premiums on 90% silver have swung dramatically. In September 2015, shortage of that particular form of silver meant we had to quote premiums as high as $6 over the spot price on so-called junk silver. A similar premium spike occurred in late 2008 and early 2009 as the financial crisis caused the physical market to decouple from the paper market. Holders of silver futures contracts and silver exchange traded products didn't see any premium bump. These financial instruments won't reflect any shortage induced premium spikes in the coin market. Owning pre-1965 silver coins give you the opportunity to see the value of your holdings diverge positively from paper prices during times of financial stress and or heavy physical demand. 
you can get a potential downside cushion and upside boost without having to pay extra for these advantages or take on additional risk. For gold investors, non-numismatic pre-1933 U.S. liberties and double eagles are well worth considering. The ones that come graded and slabbed will carry hefty collectible premiums, but the historic gold coins that Money Metals Exchange makes available currently sell for close to their melt value. Supplies of these coins are limited, and it's possible that in the future, their premiums will go up. But right now, just like junk silver coins, these circulated gold coins are a super bargain. You can order these or any other popular bullion products that we carry either online at moneymetals.com or by calling 1-800-800-1865. Well now, without further delay, let's get right to this week's exclusive interview. It is my privilege now to be joined by a man who needs little introduction, Mark Faber, editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. Dr. Faber has been a longtime guest on financial shows throughout the world and is a well-known Austrian school economist and investment advisor, and it's a tremendous honor to have him on with us today. Dr. Faber, thank you so much for joining us again, and how are you? My pleasure. Thank you. Well, to start out here, uh, Dr. Faber, before we get into some other stuff, I wanted to hear your comments on the state of the U.S. economy. Uh, now, it appears the Federal Reserve has finally gotten serious about moving rates higher, at least modestly. Uh, U.S. equity markets seem to be discounting that fact, focusing instead on the so-called Trump trade. Markets are pricing in a huge infrastructure spending program and, and tax cuts, stimulus that could overwhelm any modest tightening at the Fed. Uh, now that efforts to reform health care seem to be failing, we expected some of the optimism surrounding President Trump's other initiatives would leak out of the stock market. But so far, that hasn't happened. Stocks remain near record highs, and there isn't a whole lot of interest in safe haven assets, including precious metals. Uh, so what are your thoughts here, Mark? Is, is now a time to take some profits and move towards safety, or is there still some good upside in equities? Well, I think that in terms of the economy, I don't think the economy is as strong as people believe or as the statistics would show. And uh, recent trends have rather been indicating some weakness in auto sales and not the particularly strong housing market. And uh, we have uh, several problems as a result of excessive credit. So I think that the economy is not going to do as well as uh, people expect. And concerning the huge infrastructure expenditure that Mr. Trump has been talking about, it is about the trillion dollars over 10 years, the maximum. In other words, $100 billion a year in China. In 2016, in the first 10 months, the infrastructure expenditures were 1.6 trillion. In other words, 16 times higher than what Mr. Trump is proposing. So just to put this in a perspective, now throughout Asia and the emerging world, there will be a lot of infrastructure expenditures in the years to come. The question is, will stocks go up because of that? Maybe some stocks will go up and some will not. So we have to be now increasingly selective in what we purchase in terms of equities. My sense is that the economy in the U.S. is weakening and not strengthening. It is also possible markets aren't responding to fundamentals, and we ought to consider those ramifications, the advent of high-frequency trading and, and massive intervention by central bankers could mean markets become more irrational than ever. It is possible, for instance, to see stock prices being bid higher despite slowing GDP growth, rising interest rates, and Congress failing to deliver fiscal stimulus here in the U.S. I mean, how artificial do you think markets are, and to the extent today's markets aren't real, how much longer will the central planners and bankers be able to maintain this illusion that they've created? Well, basically, some people say that the central banks are out of bullet. This is not my impression. They can keep on printing money and uh, boost asset prices, whereby not all asset prices will go up. Some will go up and some will go down. 
but the point I want to make is the central banks are not really out of bullet. The economy, if it weakens, some stocks will outperform others. In other words, recently you've seen the weakness in automobile stocks. So there is still a selective process in the market. The stocks that have gone up the most recently are actually mostly companies with very little earnings, very high valuations, Tesla, uh, Amazon, Netflix, and so forth. And uh, we'll have to see. All I can say is, when I look around the world, I don't see any particularly good values in the U.S., except, and I have to stress this, except in mining companies. And I think some of the interest rate sensitive stocks are, again, relatively attractive because I expect the economy to disappoint, especially if the Fed continues to increase interest rates. And so a short-term increase in interest rates could mean some further weakness in bond prices, but eventually bond prices could rally again. And this is my view that the U.S., by any standards, compared to historical valuations, compared to Europe, compared to Asia, compared to emerging markets, the U.S. is very expensive. Now, can it go up another 10%, maybe 20%? Yes. Between December 1999 and 2000, March 21, when the stock market peaked out, the Nasdaq was up more than 30%. But was it a good buy? No. Everybody who bought at the time in the first three months of 2000 lost money. So my sense is that, yeah, people can buy stocks here, but most of them are going to lose money. With the exception, in my view, that mining stocks will perform reasonably well. Let's shift focus now and talk about what is happening elsewhere in the world. You've alluded to it in, in prior answers, but you were originally from Europe, and now you live in Asia. And now it's easy for Americans to focus on domestic affairs, such as the new president, and, and lose track of important developments in other parts of the world. Uh, can you update our listeners on developments you are watching in Asia, China in particular? Well, whether it's sustainable or not, uh, the fact is that the Chinese economy has been improving recently somewhat. Maybe it's all driven by credit, but for now, they have stabilized the economy. It's improving, and it has had a huge impact on the prices of resources, including copper and zinc and nickel and so forth. And it has had a favorable impact on the Asian markets. Earlier, you asked me about the U.S. You know, this, this whole euphoria about the performance of U.S. stocks. The fact is, in Asia, just about every market has outperformed the U.S. In Europe, just about every market has outperformed the U.S measured in U.S. dollar terms. So I think that uh, the impact of an improving Chinese economy is being felt more in other emerging economies than, say, in the United States. How about Europe? The future of the European Union is in question with some important elections upcoming. Banks there remain at risk, and, and several, if not most, uh, countries continue to struggle with slow growth and overwhelming debts. Give us your thoughts on Europe and how things might unfold there over the remainder of the year. Well, I've just written two reports recently highlighting that in Europe there are some companies, mostly utilities and infrastructure-related companies, that on the valuation screen appear relatively attractive. They have dividend yields of between 4 and 6%. Uh, the euro is weak or has been weak and is at a low level. And these yields of 4 to 6% are very attractive considering 
the bond yields in Europe. And so I think that this year, European stocks, and especially the stocks I mentioned, infrastructure price, utilities, and also food, will way outperform the U.S. I also happen to think that there will be more and more American companies and foreign companies that will be interested to acquire European companies. How about the geopolitical side? Uh, I know many of those nations over there, the people are watching what happens with Brexit and have watched uh, what's taken place there. Uh, France, the Netherlands, some other nations have some important votes coming up. What do you make of of everything that's happened there with uh, the state of the European Union and how those votes might go as we go throughout the year and, and see some of these important elections come to fruition? Well, this is a big question, and uh, we all don't know exactly what the answer is. My sense is that the euro will stay. And if some weak countries decide to leave the eurozone, their currencies will be obviously punished. And if some weak countries decide to leave the eurozone, I think the euro will strengthen. It's just that Say, if Italy decides to leave the Eurozone, the Euro will strengthen, but obviously the new currency will weaken of Italy. And so I think that this is not a big concern for me. Furthermore, with the Euro having declined so much against the U.S. dollar, if there is weakness, further weakness in Euro, European stocks will adjust on the upside. And foreign companies from Asia, China, Japan, and the U.S. will increasingly acquire European companies and European assets. Gold is often referred to as the anti-dollar. If we see the euro strengthen and last as a currency, does that then weigh heavily on the U.S. dollar? And might we see gold spike as a result of that because the dollar finally is starting to weaken a little bit? Yes. I mean, the consensus is, uh, or was at the beginning of the year, that the, the only game in town are U.S. stocks and the U.S. dollar. I don't believe that the U.S. dollar is uh, structurally a strong currency. Now, can it stay high as it's rallied a lot against the euro? But... Uh, at this level, I don't think that the U.S. is very competitive. So my sense would be the U- U.S. dollar is vulnerable, as well as asset prices in the U.S., both. Dr. Faber, do you see the tide changing worldwide when it comes to the importance of, of gold ownership? I mean, we know Asians are, are buying it relentlessly, and so are folks in Europe. Uh, maybe that mindset hasn't made its way to the U.S. yet, but do you sense that may be coming? And, and once it does, do you foresee any problems with being able to get physical metal once the masses, especially in the Western world, wake up to the idea that they ought to own some? Well, the gold market is very interesting because it consists of a very limited number of people who are gold bucks, as they call them. And these are people, they will accumulate gold, physical gold and gold shares and so forth, but this is a minority. And then there are the gold detractors. These are mostly fund managers, of course, central bankers, the central bankers are not particularly smart. And uh, then there are people who simply haven't heard about gold as an investment. And don't forget, say, in the U.S., 50% of the people have no interest in investments for the simple reason that they have no money. So you could show them any proposal for an investment. They wouldn't be interested because they have not the money to invest in the first place. But in general, I think that uh, people will gradually wake up to the fact that to, uh, that in absence of knowing how the world will look like in five or ten years, you need some diversification. And uh, in this environment, I think that some people will say, well, let's own some gold. 
most people will only uh, own 5 or 10%, but some people will own 20%. And I think that if the whole world decides to own just, say, 3% or 5%, and the, fan na the fund managers, who were very anti-gold, see gold prices running up again, the whole investment business has become a momentum game. So if they see that gold is moving up in a convincing way, they'll buy gold. So my sense is that you need some gold strength, and then people will come in and buy gold simply because it moves up. I buy all the time gold, of course, within my asset allocation. I also have shares and bonds and real estate, but I always buy some gold to maintain the proper weighting. Well, as we begin to close here, what do you expect for the remainder of 2017 and what kind of second half of the year do you think it will be for hard assets like gold and silver specifically? Well, at the beginning of the year, so many people have started to write reports about, you know, the surprise of 2017 and uh, projections of 2017. So everybody has a view. Nobody knows precisely, and a lot will depend on central banks' monetary policies. I don't believe central banks can tighten meaningfully. Maybe optically they do some, but in general, I think they'll keep money printing on the table as far as we can see, in other words, for the next few years. And eventually this will be friendly for precious metals and hard assets. Number two, hard assets such as uh, precious metals are at the historical low point compared to financial assets. So I think that going forward, this uh, huge discrepancy in the performance between financial assets, which has been very good, since 2009, and gold, which has been more mixed, it's also up, but it's been more mixed, especially after 2011, that uh, these hard assets will come back into favor. So if you ask me what is my expectation for the rest of 2017, I think that gold is an attractive asset class. I think precious metals can uh, easily move up another 20, 30 percent, possibly 100 percent or so. In general, I would say American investors should take the opportunity that the dollar is strong and that asset prices, in other words, stocks and bonds in the U.S. have been strong, to reduce their positions in the U.S. in terms of equities. Yeah, and certainly you hit the nail on the head earlier there with the whole momentum trade, and it'll be interesting to see what happens so if we do start to see some positive upside momentum in the metals, more and more hedge fund managers getting into that space and it really feeding on itself and creating a snowball effect there. It could be interesting to see that play out. Well, Dr. Faber, uh, thanks very much for your time and your wonderful insights, and we certainly appreciate you staying up late in, in Thailand to speak with us today. Now, before we let you go, uh, tell people how they can uh, subscribe to the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report and get your fantastic commentaries on a regular basis. It's my pleasure. The best is to go on the website, www.gloomboomdoom.com. It's all written in one word. Gloom, boom, doom. Well, excellent stuff. It's been a real honor to speak with you, Dr. Faber. I hope we can catch up with you again sometime soon. Thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Have a nice day. Well, that will do for this week. Thanks again to Dr. Mark Faber, editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. Again, the website is gloomboomdoom.com. Be sure to check that out. And don't forget to check back here next Friday for our next weekly Market Wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great weekend, everybody. 
Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes for answers to all of your questions or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds. Call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.